All right, welcome back, Social 30. We're gonna talk about political spectrums. And you know, before we talk about many of these topics, we need to establish, to some extent, um, how are you gonna be tested on it? And then, even more so, you know, independent of the test, why should you care, right? So, how would you be tested on it? The information we're about to share with you can be the building blocks of, of many multiple choice questions. The answer might be radical, moderate, reactionary, conservative, liberal. So we do need you to distinguish between these ideologies on a multiple choice exam. We'll present you some opinions and you have to uh, put them into a spectrum and figure out who would disagree or agree with each other most or put them into a uh, proper linear order. You also will be expected to analyze A1 sources and to see the ideological perspective behind the cartoon or behind the quote. And often you can label the ideological perspective as, you know, this is radical, or this is reactionary, or this is conservative, or this is liberal, or this is moderate. So you can use it on an A1 as well. Independent of the test though, uh, these terms are becoming very common in the, you know, the battlefield of the hearts and minds of North Americans. That, you know, terms like radical, reactionary, liberal, conservative, fascist, communist, socialist, they're in that uh, lexicon, right, that is being used right now, that vocabulary that's being used to try to win your hearts and minds as, as citizens in Canada and as citizens in North America. So even independent of the test, we need to know these terms because these are the words that people are using to describe themselves and to describe others and sometimes they're being used inappropriately or incorrectly and if we don't understand what they truly mean then in an Orwellian way we might be led and manipulated because we might just assume that something is radical because somebody's telling us it is but maybe it's not maybe you're being a puppet for someone else's agenda so even independent of the test, as citizens in free and democratic society, you need to know these words. So, at the end of this, we want you to know the political spectrum. And we're gonna teach it to you multiple times here. So the terms right wing, left wing, and moderate are used commonly to describe a group or an individual's ideology. So Friday, we defined ideology, and today, we're trying to say, okay, what types of ideologies are there? Sometimes we say, oh, there's a right-wing ideology, or there's a left-wing ideology. Well, hopefully by the time you leave here today, you'll know what those mean. We also may use words like radical and reactionary. So um, you should be able to create a linear spectrum in your notes at some point, and you should be able to flush out the characteristics of these ideologies. So for example, a radical is a extreme left-wing ideology. And a reactionary is an extreme right-wing ideology. So they're the two ends of the spectrum. So we're gonna need to massage out what they mean. And in between them, you would have liberals and moderates and conservatives. So this first attempt at teaching you the spectrum is designed to only really establish the two ends and then the middle. So it's, and keep in mind, this is all online, so you can always go back to it. It's gonna be on the video. It's in the digital lesson. It's in our digital textbook. So only copy down um, what you don't understand, right? Don't copy it all down. Uh, what is a radical? It's extreme left. They're willing to make sudden dramatic change, and they're often accepting of violence. These are the key characteristics. That radicals and reactionaries, at both ends, as you get further to the ends of the spectrum, you accept violence as an acceptable means to an end in a Machiavellian way. A means to an end. So what do radicals and reactionaries have in common is often a, a question we ask in multiple choice. Because it seems like they shouldn't have anything in common. They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. But they have this one thing in common is that they're both so excited to create a, a 
a world in their vision that they're willing to use violence to achieve it. So radicals and reactionaries, radicals on the extreme left, reactionaries on the extreme right, they both accept violence. But the difference between the two, radicals are trying to make progressive change. Progressive, something new. They're trying to force society to go in a new direction. So in 1917, Russia, the communist revolution led by the Bolsheviks and Lenin would be a radical revolution because communism was progressive. They had never tried it before. And it was radical also because not only was it an extreme change, a very progressive change, extremely progressive, it was also uh, achieved through violence, through the Red Army. So when I think of radical, I think of Russia, 1917, communist revolution. You know, that October revolution. Reactionaries, also violent, but they, they look to the past. They want to return back to the glory of, of the old. So in Adolf Hitler's Germany, in Mussolini's Rome, people call them reactionaries. So why would Mussolini's Rome be a better example than even Hitler's Germany? Well, what was Mussolini trying to do? He was trying to recapture the glory of Rome, the Roman Empire that had fallen in the 5th century. So he's in the 20th century trying to rediscover the glory of the Roman Empire. He looks to the past for symbols of the strength of the Romans. And because he's looking to the past to seek answers to today's problems, we call him a reactionary. Mussolini's a reactionary. Mussolini's a reactionary, Lenin's a radical, but they're both very violent people. So radicals and reactionaries agree on the acceptable use of violence, but they disagree as to where the, the solutions lie. Radicals are looking towards something new, something progressive, and reactionaries are looking to the past and saying, you know what, let's try this again. You know, the answers to today's problems lie in the past. How many people feel fairly comfortable with radical and reactionary? So here's the twist. If I was living in Moscow today, and I'm like, man, communism makes sense. Am I a radical or am I a reactionary? So you would think I'm a radical based upon this concept. I'm an internationalist because communists believe in a worldwide revolution. But communism happened in the past in the USSR. So I'm looking to the past of the Soviet Union for answers to today's problems. So in 2020, living in Moscow, if I'm saying, you know what, we need Stalin again. We need to go back to communism, then that might actually be seen as reactionary. But if you're looking at it as part of a worldwide revolution, an international revolution, workers of the world unite, something that hadn't really ever happened in a, in a real theological sense, not theological, I'm just gonna say theory, because it's not coming out right, uh, then, then it would be radical. So what is a moderate? A moderate somewhere in between. Less violent, not accepting violence, and, you know, in favor of some changes to the status quo, but nothing so dramatic. So there's another way to, to show you the spectrum uh, before I get into the next set of notes. So another way to go through the spectrum, I'm going to write it on the side board over here, is to start with conservatives. Man, my mask is just a little bit too small. What you get for having a giant head. So, conservatives like the status quo, and politically it's seen as a right-wing ideology, conservatism. It's not reactionary, it's not extreme, but it's on the right of center. So, these guys like it the way it is. They're happy with the way it is. These guys want it to be the way it was. These guys want to change it and make it something new. 
These guys want to make it something really new. So that's another way to look at the spectrum, is how much change and in what direction do you want the change to go? Conservatives don't really like change. They, they like it the way it is. But Don Cherry is a conservative. Hockey is meant to be played in Canada by Canadians. We wear poppies on Remembrance Day. We honor our soldiers. It's the way it is. It's the way it has been. It, it works. Why change it? Reactionaries want to go back to a glorious past and willing to use violence to achieve it. Don Cherry's not killing people to force them to wear poppies. He's not like the Dark Knight Batman at night going around attacking people that are too liberal. To the left of Cherry, to the left of Conservatives, to the left of our leader, Aaron O'Toole of the Conservative Party of Canada, we have people that are more liberal, more progressive. They're trying to create something new, a new vision. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau talks about you know, the 2030 agenda and changing Canada and thinks that COVID's actually an opportunity for the state to change its relationship with us and the fabric of Canada. And that's scaring the crap out of people on the right. Because it's talking about, you know, creating an even deeper state. A state that is returning back to some paternalism, to be honest. And then the further you go left, the more radical the change becomes and the more violent you, you are willing to become to achieve it. So another way to understand the spectrum is to say how much change and in what direction are we talking about change? We're saying let's go back, it's reactionary, we like it how it is, it's conservative, we want it to change, you're liberal, the more change, the more liberal, to the point that if you get violently in favor of change, you're a reactionary. I don't know, I think it's pretty easy. But it, it is one of the most, I would say it's in the top five um, confusing ideas of the, of the course. Top five. So if you can make it through today, it's kind of like that old song. Song, if you can make it through December, we'll be fine. And I'll sing it all December. But uh, this is one of the more difficult concepts. We're going to go through it again, though, just to make sure you have, that's what I do. I do things multiple times. In repetition, there's understanding. That's why you read the textbook first, you preview my lessons, you can watch the Williams stuff, you can watch my summer school stuff, you can review after our lessons the stuff that we say together. There's no reason why you're not gonna excel in this course. So, uh, another way to look at the political spectrum is to play around with some of the words. So we have liberalism and conservatism. We talked about them today already, right? So conservatism is the status quo, which is to the right of center. They value tradition. We have, in the classic sense, people like Edmund Burke. And in a modern sense, um, you have individuals like our leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, Aaron O'Toole. Liberals are more progressive. Progressive meaning in favor of change. They're to the left of center. And we'll have a whole list of liberals to, to play around with. Um, politically and economically as the course progresses. In 1776, Adam Smith was a liberal because capitalism was a new idea. It's not so liberal anymore, right? That's why we had to change the word classic liberal to modern liberal and, and, and redefine what liberalism means. But we also have fascism and we also have communism. So fascism can, can be a difficult thing to say, where does it fit on a spectrum? On this spectrum, because Mussolini was a reactionary, we're putting it as a far right thing on that spectrum. But honestly, um, this is such a one-dimensional di definition of, of fascism. Fascism is probably better defined in a quadrant of political freedom and control and economic freedom and control. So if we've got this spectrum here, so... We're going to go like this. Let's go economics this way. So this is capitalism on this side. This is freedom. 
And this will be communism or socialism on this side. This is control. And then you have politics going this way, with democracy up at the top, and dictatorship at the bottom. All fascism is, is authoritarian capitalism. So it's a mix of political control and economic freedom. So I would say that putting fascism here is somewhat misleading. Just saying fascism's a reactionary. Yes, for Mussolini it certainly was. But I would think a better definition of fascism is trying to put it in on a quadrant of politics and economics. Saying what is it? It's authoritarian capitalism. Fascism is, is a mix of freedom and control. And I always reference Oscar Schindler and his factory. Schindler owned the factory, but the government told him what to make. So it's a mix. So we will have a mini unit on fascism, but because it's mentioned up there, I thought I'd introduce it. And there's that quadrant I was just massaging out. So, what is fascism? It's authoritarian capitalism. What is, what is communism? Authoritarian socialism. So what, what did Stalin and, and Hitler have in common? Authoritarianism, they're both dictators. But economically, they were dictators with a different vision. Economically, at least in theory, Stalin's vision is everyone should be equal, and uh, you know, communism, you know, to each according to his ability, from each according to his need. And you have Hitler over there saying, no, everybody's unequal. Some people should be promoted at the expense of others. So they're both authoritarian, but they're not the same. So this is where language and precision of language is important. Fascism, authoritarian capitalism. Communism, authoritarian socialism. So another way to look at the spectrum is to blow it up and put another spectrum on top of it. So another way that might resonate with you is to use the Canadian version. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about the Canadian parties. Well, it might surprise you that the Liberal Party of Canada is more of a, a moderate, middle-of-the-road party than a, a left-wing party. So although the word liberalism is often defined on the left side of the spectrum, the Liberal Party of Canada is quite a moderate party, a centralist party. That's why there are governments so often, is by being in the center, there's more people that politically identify there. There's a bigger base. It would make sense that the NDP would be a little further to the left, because they would like to see the government uh, create more freedom through government. They'd like to see universal daycare. They'd like to see more homing for, or housing for the homeless. And the further right-wing party in Canada would be the Conservatives. In the US model, Republicans would be their right-wing party, and the Democrats would probably be their other right-wing party. The Democrats are really not that socialist yet. They might be pulled in that direction in the 10 years in our future, but the Democrats are not more socialist than our Liberal Party of Canada. There might be some Democrats, like Bernie Sanders, that may be more socialist, but as a party, they're still um, attached to the middle and somewhat to the right of the spectrum. So we have to be careful. In Japan, the most conservative party is called the Liberal Party of, of Japan. So name alone will not define you ideologically. You have to look at, well, what, what are your values? What are your assumptions? What kind of role should government play? So liberalism is an ideology that has evolved. We've talked about that. And has inspired many reactions. And that's chapter 3 and 4 of the textbook. So now we're just going to summarize that. So we have a list of what classic liberalism was, and some of the people attached to it, like John Locke. And we're going to get to modern liberalism. And modern liberalism is more, again, 
There's a lot to write down here. I wouldn't write it all down. This is freedom from government. This is freedom through government. That's it. That's all you need. Freedom from, freedom through. That's a pretty easy distinct, distinction to make. So, freedom through government. This is why liberalism today will accept social welfare. Government needs to play a role in my freedom. Whereas historically, freedom from government, this is capitalism. That's how liberalism goes from being capitalist to being slightly socialist. Is they stop saying freedom from and start saying freedom through government because of some of the problems with classic liberalism that you see in chapters three and four. Socially, modern liberals still want greater levels of freedom and personal choice. So a modern liberal might be pro-choice, whereas a modern conservative might be pro-life on the issue of abortion. And then we've got another list of notes on this is what classic liberalism is, and this is what 20th century liberalism looks like. So this would be additional notes you can go back to if you don't understand it. And then we have some notes on related philosophers. So this would be what I would call the enrichment enhancement. Go back to this if you're confused and or looking to get you know as close to 100 as possible. We also talked about conservatism with uh, Edmund Burke. The idea that they're grounded in the status quo. That they see themselves as part of a great chain of being. But conservatives also value things like law and order, tradition, they want small government. Most conservatives are also capitalists. In a modern sense. So that's why we're going to have to say neoconservatism versus classic. Because you can see up here, classic conservatives, self-interest is harmful. Neocons, people like Ronald Reagan and Thatcher, they believe in capitalism. To cure the British disease with socialism was like trying to cure leukemia with leeches. Thatcher looked at a problem in England and said, our solution, we need more capitalism. So much like liberalism has changed, the word conservatism has changed. It still means that you, know, you like traditions, but one of the things that has changed is how much capitalism do you like? If Adam Smith was a liberal in 1776, then conservatives in 1776 probably didn't like it. The conservatives today do like it. That's because modern liberals like socialism, and then conservatives like a little capitalism. Here's a quote from Margaret Thatcher. And in the quote, you can see that her solution is more individualism. Her solution is more capitalism. Her solution is less modern liberalism and more neoconservatism. I think we've been through a period where too many people have been given to understand that if they have a problem, it's the government's job to cope with it. Freedom through government, modern liberalism. I have a problem, I'll get a grant. I'm homeless, the government must house me. They're casting their problem on society, and you know, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families, and no government can do anything except through people. And people must look to themselves first. Self-interest, the value of individualism. It's our duty to look after ourselves and then also to look after our neighbor. So yes, you can be charitable to your neighbor, but that doesn't have to be channeled or funneled through government through taxation. People have got the entitlements too much in mind without the obligations. There is no such thing as entitlement unless someone has first met an obligation. So she... Margaret Thatcher, responding to a crisis in, in her Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, and the crisis was that government debt was becoming, um, you know, uh, crippling, and there's massive unemployment because people thought, you know what, why am I going to work if I'm guaranteed an income through the government? And she's like, you know what, forget that. You got to look after yourself first. We're bankrupting the country. 
Pennies don't fall from heaven, she said. Pennies don't fall from heaven. They have to be earned here on earth. That self-interest, that capitalism, begins this idea of neoconservatism. But back in 1776, when, when Adam Smith was a liberal for introducing capitalism, a lot of conservatives didn't like capitalism because it was something new. So a key message today is when you're identifying what's a conservative, what's a liberal, you have to say, well, what's the time period? Because something that's conservative in the 1900s, in the 19th century even, might be liberal today, or more likely, something liberal then might be conservative today. So it might have been a very liberal thing in 1850 to say women should have the right to vote. But today, it's, it's almost expected that everybody has that opinion, that women have the right to vote. So there's more notes here, if you need more notes on the evolution of liberalism. This is a summary of some of the textbook stuff about the Enlightenment and some key notes. Maybe skim through it. You don't need to memorize the story of, of how liberalism came to be. And that has already been up there one more time. So that's the end of that document. It does talk about some of the issues that we're having in classic liberalism, and that's why we needed to continue to evolve. Issues like poor wages, poor working conditions, long hours, um, and we'll come back to that when we look at chapter three and four a little bit more. But let's finish up this idea of the spectrum. So again, we have radical, moderate, reactionary. We have these terms. We have radicals and reactionaries that begin to look a lot alike because they both accept violence, even though they want to pull society in different directions, new and old. We have the idea of fascism being in terms of a combination of the two spectrums, authoritarian capitalism. We have the application on Canada, but now let's flush it out a little bit more with these extra notes. So another way to look at the spectrum now is to say we have a political spectrum. What if we said let's have an economic spectrum? Now the confusion that this creates is just because you're here doesn't mean you're here. You could be here and you could be over here, right? So anytime that you're looking at a spectrum, you have to take a second and say, what is it that I'm looking at here? This is a political spectrum where what we're measuring is how much change, social change, are you accepting and in which direction. On an economic spectrum, you're basically asking how much government do you want in your life? Do you want very little government or do you want a lot of government? And if you can understand that, the economic spectrum becomes simple. This is centrally planned economics, USSR. This is capitalism. America of the 1920s. So this becomes easy if you don't confuse it with this. You need to distinguish them. They're both spectrums. But a spectrum could be anything. You know, on a spectrum of 0 to 10, you know, how much are you hating this course right now is a different question than on a spectrum of 0 to 10, how much do you like ice cream? But they both look like spectrums. So some of the confusion is that they both look like spectrums and people will use the term left wing or right wing from one and just assume it fits with the other. So as you can see on a dictatorship spectrum, there's di or sorry, a political spectrum, there's dictatorships at both ends. So we need to be as precise as possible. Rather than just saying left wing and right wing, we have to worry ourselves about these extremes. It's probably better to use these words like reactionary and radical. So down here we have socialism and capitalism, but as we get further to the extreme, we would have authoritarian socialism, which would be communism. 
and you'd have authoritarian capitalism, which is fascism. And again, this is the combined spectrum that we had, the quadrant. And I think the quadrant makes better sense. So, let's look at some of the values now. What does it mean to be a collectivist? Well, why do you work? A collectivist works for the common good. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need, that's what somebody on the economic left is working for, the common good. They want to create egalitarianism. They want to create equality. The further to the left you go, the more absolute you want the equality to be. To left of center, the NDP, they might want to equalize people in Canada, but maybe not everybody's lives are completely the same. But in the Soviet Union, you'd want to see that everyone has their needs met. So from each according to his ability to each according to his need, that's more absolute than just, say, some socialism mixed in with Canada's capitalism. So what values define economic collectivism? Incentive is to work for the community, the common good, to create egalitarianism from each according to his ability to each according to his need. In fact, what am I? I am my brother's keeper. If my fellow citizen is in need, I'm the solution. Not, not uh, uh, you know, my heart and mind is there. I don't have to be convinced. I don't have to be taxed. I just know that that's my purpose on earth is to help others. So we share in our profit. The entire community benefits. We don't have some wealthy and some poor. Everyone shares. Need to provide the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people. Serve the common good. So in order to do this, how do you achieve economic collectivism? Well, we're going to be inviting the state into our lives to control things like wages and prices. So in Canada, we have some of this. We have like minimum wage. But in a centrally planned economy, that would be more universal for everything. How much does bread cost? Well, the state's going to decide that so everybody can afford bread and afford water. How much does a third year scientist make? Well, the state's gonna decide that. So we have wages and prices controlled to allow access to consumer items for all, especially essentials, like electricity, bread, and gasoline. Cooperation is good. Therefore, the state is gonna have monopolies on everything essential and nearly everything. So state monopolies, meaning you probably work for the state. So rather than having, you know, within Wetaska when we have individual companies, you would have state-run companies. Social assistance. If there's, in, if there's private corporations, they're heavily taxed. Chances are there's not. Lots of universal programs like healthcare, Key industries that existed before the collectivist revolution would be nationalized, meaning the state just seizes them and say, now the state owns them. Trying to achieve a decent standard of living for all. Very least, you're gonna regulate industries that do exist outside the state. And the problem is they see capitalism as, and individualism as creating the malaise of modernity and only benefiting some. And then you have the opposite, economic individualism. Instead of the incentive to work for others, the incentive is to work for you. That's the invisible hand, that's Adam Smith. You pursue your own interests. The state doesn't set up you with their interests. Rather than the collectivist hands-on approach to the economy, Smith wants a hands-off approach from the government to the economy. So let's deregulate, let's Let's privatize instead of nationalize. Let's force citizens to care for their own social welfare. So let's get rid of things like health care and education that are paid by the state. These should be user pay health care, user pay education. And individualists like to grow economic opportunities. So let's get rid of tariffs and have free trade globally. So going back to social 10, that would be, hey, I like the IMF, I like the World Bank, I like the WTO.
Government is inefficient is a assumption of individualists, that when the government gets involved, it'll be inefficient and perhaps corrupt. So that's another way to look at spectrums, is to look at the values that people have on them. Now I also have a Prezi that goes through the spectrums. So hopefully in repetition you're having the need to write less and less down because you're hearing stuff for the third and fourth time. So another way to look at ideological spectrums is to take a quick peek at this Prezi that is slowly loading. So we can go to the Learn Alberta website and on it they just take the spectrum and they play around with it a little bit but I had already pulled those uh, visuals out and put them in a previous slide for you. So here we have fascism. This is what fascists believe. This is what reactionaries believe. Driven to see regressive change to the good old days. So much they're willing to kill and die to restore the reality that once was. At this point you're probably like, yeah, I get that. I'm not writing that down. I know that. Uh, then we have conservatives. What do they like? They like the status quo. They like, uh, you know what, those wise dead guys that got us here, that they knew something. We're part of a great chain of being, Edmund Burke. We value traditions and family. And yes, we do favor the elite because they're probably the elite because they have greater merit. They have greater ability. Government is too large and inefficient. The heartbeat of the nation is individual self-reliance. And then we have liberals. They enjoy the status quo as well, but they would like to see a little bit more progressive change. This is where the majority of Canadians are. This is economically the homes of Canadian economics and FDR's New Deal. Then we have the NDP. And, and this might be the term liberal. Instead of the Liberal Party of Canada, this is the term liberal. So again, it's funny that the NDP party in Canada, or the NDP in Canada is, is more liberal than the Liberal Party. But what does it mean to be a liberal in the spectrum in favor of progressive change, achieved through peaceful means? That's key. So all that violence in America, that's not so liberal, that's becoming radical. Change is needed to help the disadvantaged. Government needs to spend money on social programs, can raise corporate taxes to get the funds. They should perhaps nationalize key industries, provide universal daycare, healthcare, home, housing, and things like that. And then you have communism. We want something so new, we're going to use violence to achieve it. Then we have the Democrats and the Republicans in the states, and then we have all these things that we just went through. So economic individualism, incentive to work is from you, it's more of a hands-off than a hands-on. Everyone should provide for themselves. I like this language, unfettered operation of the workplace. It means government doesn't get in the place. It should be unfettered, be unregulated. Prices should be determined by supply and demand, by the invisible hand, not by the state. So we don't want regulated prices. Let's have low corporate taxes, user pay, and then, yeah, the collectivists were the opposite, economic collectivism. So not only have we reviewed the spectrum, we're, we've reviewed individualism and collectivism here. You're your brother's keeper, from each according to his need, or from each according to his ability to each according to his need. We regulate prices, we cooperate, we provide social assistance to people in need, we redistribute wealth, we protect people from the greed and the excesses of capitalism. So yeah, that's that as well. Wrapping up lesson three then, we have some additional notes, repetition of some stuff we've already seen. And going back to the spectrum one more time. We have a very uh, detailed visual here that uh, you're not gonna be able to see from your desk. And I would suggest to you that it is a visual you might wanna go back to because they do a good job breaking down the values of the two sides and the beliefs and stuff like that. So definitely I would go back to it. 
comparing the right in the US to the left in the US. And then we have some multiple choice questions to challenge you a little bit. And they won't be that big of a challenge. So let's start with number 19. The above statement suggests that Canadians are traditionalists, politically moderate, supporters of the status quo, or committed more to political collectivism than to political individualism. So this is how you'll get tested on this stuff in multiple choice. So zooming in, Canadians are more, most comfortable gathered in the political center. So based on that first sentence, you can probably jump to an answer already. And the answer is, based on the first sentence, what do you think the answer might be? So the answers are traditionalists, politically moderate, supporters of the status quo, committed more to political collectivism than individualism. First sentence says Canadians are most comfortable gathered in the political center. Based on that sentence, I already know the answer, and the answer is? I heard somebody say B. Who said B? You'd be correct, yeah. Because B is, it says political center. What is a political center? It's not a traditionalist. That's political right. Supporters of the status quo, that's a traditionalist, that's political right. Committed more to political collectivism than political individualism. Uh, that might be the extremes. That's radical and reactionary. The only one it can be is B. That's how you get tested on this. And it's pretty easy. Oh, well, let's try another one. This is so much fun. So lots to play around with here. Four different ideologies. On the above chart, which one is conservatism? Ideology one, two, three, or four? Oh, I've got it. So it's one of those things that once you start chunking language together, it becomes so easy. So it says, which of those ideologies is conservatism? Now I think back in my head. Words that go with conservatism, traditionalism, right? Family values, man, it becomes too easy then. So the answer is, which one has tradition and family values? Right here. So it's got the ideology too. So that's conservatism. And things like support for long-standing political institutions, support for things that have been around a long time, yeah, that sounds like conservatism. Makes sense. To see similarities among these ideologies, one should look at what? The social beliefs of two, the ideology of three. This one's going to take a lot more time. So this will be one. I'm going to ask you tomorrow at the beginning of class again. Try to keep you going back into these things. So I'm going to ask you number 22, and maybe 23 at the beginning of class tomorrow, and 24. So. Give you some time to look at that later. These ones are nice because we have a little snowflake next to the right answer. So imagine if I forgot to take those away on the on the exam and, and you didn't get 100. Present day political scientists would most probably place today's Russia at what? So what is Russia today? Well, it's kind of in a weird spot because we have Russia claiming itself to be democratic but it's really not that democratic. Yeah, you have Vladimir Putin acting as an authoritarian, but not an extreme one like you might have seen in the Soviet Union's past or in North Korea today. So it's not an extreme authoritarian state, but it's definitely authoritarian. If they're a democracy, then they're a flawed one, an illiberal one. And what are we seeing here? Levels of political control. So. Want to do a quiz? Yeah, we do. So we'll do a quiz after we're done the video, and then we're going to do some cartoon analysis. So I'm going to stop doing this, and I'm going to get you guys to do a quiz. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, we're going to do the quiz as a, group, as a group, and I'm going to go around and randomly punch somebody in the face if you guys get one wrong. Seems fair. Seems like a fair thing to do.